Hello everyone and welcome to Tome of Uselessness. Uh, this is Dan here, solo casting. Unfortunately, Devin and I, our schedules just didn't jive this time. So I'm going to be doing a solo uh, episode here and we're going to save our topic that we had planned on talking about for the new year, I guess, because we were going to talk about the first half of BoJack Horseman Season 6, which is out on Netflix now. But like I said, we'll, we're probably going to save that for when the second half comes out and then just do like a review, I guess, of the entire season. I did watch it, of course, because like I said, prepped for what we were going to record, but would recommend highly. I really enjoyed the first season and thought that it was a good setup for a season two, or sorry, a part two, because I'm very much interested to see where it kind of goes. Before I kind of get into the topic here, which is going to be Dr. Sleep and a little bit about The Shining, uh, just wanted to highlight some more stuff that uh, I've been kind of reading or looking at this week or in the last little while. So I read the Flashpoint comics, which is an old uh, DC event, you know, where basically the yellow flash altered time and then you got some weird uh, alternate timeline stuff where Aquaman, you know, took over the world and, or not the world, but most of it. (laughs) And, uh, you know, Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne died in the alleyway and his uh, parents survived and they go nuts and stuff like that so it was really good i really enjoyed it i didn't read all of the tie-in stuff but i read a good majority of it and i did enjoy the those comics there i've also um kind of gone back i'm a big fan of stargate uh, sg1 in the movies i haven't actually seen all of uh like atlantis and stuff like that so i'll probably be revisiting that but I was kind of like, I remember seeing that there were books, so I looked it up, and there are some books, uh, quite a few of them, and so I read through a couple of them, but what was funny was, like, I just took the first one that they published, read it, and uh, I kind of got a sense of where it took place in the story, and then I read the next one, and it was further back in the timeline, and I was just like, oh no, I think I've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> and so I kind of looked it up and, you know, figured out where each book kind of actually follow falls chronologically, so I can hopefully read it sort of more chronologically in the future. I thought the craziest thing was that they're still publishing Stargate SG-1 novels, like one came out this year. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool, and I guess there's still a market for it. Uh, That was kind of neat. The next book, so uh, I read Ghost Brigades, which was uh, number two in the Old Man War, Old Man's War, sorry, um, series of books, which I think there are six of those in the main series and maybe a couple short stories that have gone along with it. So it's like a sci-fi space opera. I just searched in the library and just kind of came across it. So far, really enjoying it. Cool concept and uh, neat tech and just kind of the futuristic world that uh, the author is presenting and building. So really enjoyed that. As far as some TV shows, so the last time I recorded with Devin, I mentioned that the show Watchmen started up on HBO and... I'm still watching it, still really enjoying it, actually, which is, I'm almost kind of waiting for the shoe to drop, <laughs> where it's just kind of like, oh, this just turned terrible. But I don't know, I, don't, I think it's uh, it's going along really well. I think episode six, I think I just want to say, maybe five or six, just aired the other day, and it was really good, like, really enjoyed it, super solid hour of television, so still really enjoying that. I don't know how many episodes are going to be in this first kind of season, but if there's anything to go on from previous stuff, I assume 10 to 13 from, you know, Game of Thrones and Westworld and that kind of thing. The Dark Materials have started up, His Majesty's Dark Materials, which is also an HBO show, based off of the Philip Pullman novels of the same name. That's a trilogy there. So I'm, again, not sure what their plan is. I assume one season per book, which would make sense. Um, this show is only three episodes in at this time of the recording. Really enjoying it, liking the cast, liking, again, the world, and just kind of the, uh, like we've talked about many times on the show now, it's like we can make movies and shows look just good, like really, you know, the, the methods to make these things is a lot better now, right? So, yeah, really enjoying that. Um, and if you're a fan of it, uh, Rick and Morty has just started up again. Um, I've watched the first couple episodes. Very much enjoyed that as well. The last two things here. So <laughs> everything else there on the list was, you know, varying levels of fun or entertaining and this and that kind of thing. The last two books that I'm going to talk about here were both nonfiction and they were both pretty downers. <laughs> and 
So the first one was called uh, The Rise of uh, The Rise of the Warrior Cop. And it has a long subtitle after that, but that's basically the the first part. And that's about the militarization of America's police force. You know, it focuses on that. Uh, it was written by an American. But, you know, you can see some of that, of course, in other police forces around the world. And it's it's just brutal. It's just brutal reading it that it's just like from the get go, it was wrong essentially or just like you know with the wrong mandate and even today you can see it so much that how it's used for you know drug stuff and this and that and then terrorism they amped up and so it, he basically mainly talks about how it's like the yeah how military equipment is getting into the, the day-to-day police forces and you know and the overuses of SWAT teams and stuff like that so a lot of statistics it you know it's kind of dry but it also highlights a lot of stories and it was just it was a brutal read it was it was really good and very interesting but uh not for the faint of heart which also the second book (laughs) uh so i read the uninhabitable earth which was also uh about climate change and global warming and those effects and basically looking forward into the future and to what's going to happen and this guy he admits like he's not a climate scientist and but he's been just kind of compiling stories of you know disasters related to global warming and climate change and all that kind of stuff like that for years now and he's done several articles about it and he's written for the new yorker and stuff and so he read that wrote this book and again it's just brutal like it you can't help but get a sense of man we're really screwing this up (laughs) and it's uh, again just a brutal read, and there's no even like chapter where it's like, oh, maybe here's some stuff we can do because I think you know there's a lot of that that's been talked about already, kind of thing. So he doesn't really focus in on that, but it's just basically you know he talks about our water drinking, and then uh, you know how that's going to change, and then how the arable land's going to change, and how you know coastlines are going to change, just everything, um, and into the future of not just you know 2100 but into 2040 2030 2050 right like uh so it was it was some brutal stuff it was a you know again a very good read i just couldn't stop reading but it was again not for the faint of heart in that kind of sense where this is not an uplifting tale and especially like i said it was pre-published i think this year and so it's like you know we're living it is part of the problem right and that's his point is that it's you know it's not just like a past history or we shouldn't have perspective on this it's we're seeing this in our day-to-day lives so yeah that was some stuff that uh, i've checked out of late and you know wanted to highlight some of those things here before moving on so so yeah uh, when Devin and i kind of figured that we wouldn't be able to record together and I was like oh you know what I'll do is um I'll go see Dr. Sleep and then talk about it because one I remember hearing about this movie like a long time ago maybe but I was not even sure it was like real <laughs> like as I knew the I knew the the book came out the the Dr. Sleep uh, sequel that he wrote and again I was just like I don't know what what Stephen King could have done so I I didn't know I like I didn't read Dr. Sleep and I nor have I read The Shining and when I heard that this movie was out, I was just kind of morbidly curious, I would say, because The Shining is one of my favorite movies. And uh, when we did that horror episode with uh, our guests, we had Tony and Logan, I think it was on, and we talked about some of my favorite horror movies. The Shining, of course, came up, and it was not only my favorite, it was many people's favorites. And it's just such a good movie and like things we talked about in there but of course that was from 1980 from Stanley Kubrick and uh, so he based it on Stephen King's novel but basically made his own version of it which I think is everyone can agree for the most part that it's for the better because Stephen King sometimes great ideas but you know you just can't focus up or what have you and it starred, of course, Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, Danny Lloyd, and Scatman Carruthers, and a couple other people, but those were kind of the main. And that movie, I know from the time, and I know from, like, you know, studying things that, like, how much that movie has influenced even just filmmaking. Like, I don't see that as much, because growing up, this movie was already around and people were already aping those techniques and stuff like that and using them. So that's not really kind of what I see. Like, yes, the movie is brilliantly shot and, you know, everything about it is great. Don't get me wrong. But it's like, 
that's not why I appreciate it. Uh, it seems I just can't stop watching this movie. Like I, when I turn it on, I just love watching it. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> uh, it's just so enjoyable. And Jack Nicholson's performance, even Shelley Duvall's performance, is just incredible. It, her just <laughs> she's always just seems like so positive and up, upbeat until it all goes terribly wrong. Whereas Jack Nicholson, you know, with his slow descent into madness, it's just incredible. I was, like I said, just curious as to what their plan was. Like, what were they going to do? I'll talk a little bit of non-spoiler stuff first before I get into some, some, some spoiler stuff about the movie. But, yeah, The Shining... So I watched it the night before I went and saw Doctor Sleep. So I was like, okay, did, like, you know, the back-to-back, as it were. So I could get the full context and experience, almost in a sense. And so Doctor Sleep was directed by Mike Flanagan... Uh, based off the novel, like I mentioned, from Stephen King. Uh, so Mike Flanagan wrote it, directed it, as well as edited it, which I thought was kind of interesting when I saw that credit uh, come up at the end. So it was like, this was his his idea, his vision, his what he wanted. I, I assume, again, of course, because this was a major studio release, that there was, you know, there's always input and stuff like that kind of thing. But uh, it was mostly the one guy, which I was kind of like, okay. At least he got to make the movie he wanted to make. I think because he did Gerald's Game, which admittedly I haven't seen, but it's comes highly recommended on like, you know, Netflix queues and everything like that. So you have to check that one out. So, but my point was he made that one for Netflix, which was a King adaptation. And I would imagine he didn't have as much outside input. So he got to do what he wanted to do. He's also made, uh, he also made Oculus and Hush and a couple other things. So I was like, okay, this guy, He's got the horror stuff going here. Uh, the budget for the movie was about $45 million. And so far, like when I saw it, the movie's been out for a couple weeks now. And it's only made $54.2 million worldwide. So not to uh, lighten it up at the box office, as it were. <laughs> but again, I think it was just timing. This movie was released in November. Maybe to avoid some, of the, some other horror-type movies. But it's also... Okay, before we get all into it... <laughs> Uh, let's let's go through some of the cast here. So you, it's got Ewan McGregor. He plays Dan Torrance, so Jack Nicholson's son from the first movie. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson plays Rose the Hat, and I thought she was really great, and she's done really well in the recent Mission Impossibles and stuff like that. Uh, Kylie Curran plays Abra Stone. Cliff Curtis plays Billy Freeman. Uh, you got Zan McLaren, uh, who plays Crow Daddy, and he also... He, I recognize him immediately from Westworld. He was one of my favorite storylines there. Was He was Achiquita from Westworld Season 2. Uh, Emily Ann Lind plays Snake Bite Andy. Selena Adzuz, Apron Annie. Uh, Robert Longstreet plays Barry the Chuck. The Chunk, sorry. Barry the Chunk. <laughs> and Karel Strukian plays Grandpa Fleck. And so the... the Kylie Curran plays Abra Stone, who's like a teenager in this movie, and I thought she did a really good job. Uh, and Ewan McGregor, of course, playing Dan Torrance, our main kind of character. I really enjoyed his performance, and I liked, you know, it was kind of like, what can you do? He's supposed to be tortured by these visions, got kind of a PTSD kind of thing going on, you know, he drinks and etc. So, but the movie arc is he cleans himself up to try to become a better man and all that kind of stuff like that. But back to what I was saying, sorry, about the, like, the release. So, this movie to me, it was not a horror movie. Because it wasn't scary. And it kind of fell more towards almost like an action vampire kind of story. And so this movie was definitely more of a sequel to Stephen King material than it was to The Shining by Kubrick. And from what I understand, they burn... Stephen King burns the Overlook Hotel down at the end of the book. So the fact that it's even in this movie is makes it a different version. Um, but the basic premise is, is, like I said, Dan Torrance, he's trying to change his life around. He's still got The Shining. And then he gets in contact with this girl, Abra, who can shine more than like he can. She's really powerful. But then we're introduced to um, Rose the Hat and her crew, and they hunt and feed off of kids who can shine or people who can shine, but mostly children because they're just easier to capture and stuff like that. And then they use the fact, that power to live longer 
and they also have their own kind of abilities. Uh, so it's not totally all defined what they can all do, but they can definitely do stuff. <laughs> like the, the one snake by any character, she can more like suggest stuff to people and they'll do it. And, you know, other people can do like illusion stuff or it seems like, you know, uh, Crow Daddy has the ability to more to like find the uh, people who can shine better than other people and stuff like that. So what I really did like in the movie was the depiction of kind of their power usage. Uh, so you get some good scenes of like uh, Rebecca Ferguson and even... Uh, so Rose the Hat, Dan Torrance, and Abra, you know, using their powers and doing uh, different things with them. Um, so there's a great sequence that I really liked with Rebecca Ferguson when she tries to track down Abra, and then she, like, goes into her mind, and and it was a trap. Abra had set up a trap, and she kind of reverses it on her, and there were some cool visuals and just some cool stuff there because it's hard to depict something like that, you know, when people just stare at each other <laughs> and they're having like a mind battle, <laughs> right? And in a book, of course, it can be described as all this big elaborate stuff. And our use of technology now allows us to create these, you know, cathedrals and mind palaces and whatever. Uh, but, it, you know, sometimes it go too far or it can just look weird, but I thought it, w it worked well in this movie uh, for that stuff. The only thing I didn't really like was there was a scene where uh, a child gets killed, actually a cameo by Jacob Tremblay, and he gets captured, and they're killing him, and then Abra it, like was in contact with him and senses this, and she uses her... She's communicating with Dan Torrance on like a blackboard, and the blackboard breaks, and it breaks into the red rum, which I think is on the poster, or it says murder or whatever, but it's the exact same way that he wrote that back on the the door when he was saying red rum. I was like, eh, I don't know. That was one of my problems with the movie, was the things that borrow, like, this, like the shot recreation from The Shining. I was kind of like, eh, I don't, I don't know about this, like, because they recreate uh, Danny Torrance riding around his little his little uh, big wheel in the hotel, and I was just like, yeah, I don't know. It wasn't kind of doing it for me as well. <laughs> I did appreciate, because they eventually go back to the hotel, which I think is probably revealed in the trailer, because why wouldn't they show you everything? They go back to the hotel, the Overlook, and they recreate it really, uh, really detailed and really the same, right? Uh, which I liked that, and that, that was kind of cool, and they, you know, they weathered it and aged it. Yeah, in some parts, I don't know. Like, like I was saying, uh, overall, before I get into anything too spoilery here, it wasn't scary, and it's not like a total action movie. It's just kind of like sort of a, 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 it's a, it's a kind of a vampire story. Um, but I didn't hate it. But I wasn't like it wasn't The Shining, because <laughs> nothing else is. So I don't know. I kind of fall in the middle of it. It, it, you know, somewhere in there where it's like, it was watchable. It's long, but it didn't seem that long. So the pacing was good. I was interested in the characters enough that, like I said, I, I kept on watching and just kind of wanted to see what was going to happen. So yeah, what I was going to say was right in the beginning, uh, they, they had they get an actress to do... She does a great Shelby Duvall impression. <laughs> or they used audio of her saying Danny from The Shining. I didn't kind of like the... So this was where I feel like this was probably from the book more so than The Shining movie. Was the idea that the spirits that were in the Overlook Hotel that we encounter in The Shining movie could get out from the Overlook and then kind of track down other people who shine in the world because they like... They want to feed off of it, so they're going to come after Danny Torrance, which I was kind of like, eh, I don't know about that, because, and they do have a line, because uh, the guy who is also playing like a, uh, a Scat Carruthers, he has a line about some reason about how they didn't really bother him when he was there, because he wasn't as powerful, but I was like, I don't know, that just doesn't make sense, kind of thing, like, it's like, how could he have worked at the Overlook Hotel, but these ghosts are hungry and trying to eat people, you know, is shine power whatever <laughs> so but then the fact that they're out there in the world and then he has to like trap them and stuff like that i was like ah, i don't know about that 
because they they you know they want to set that up because at the end he unleashes the ghosts on to Rose the Hat and to try to use them to like attack her. So I don't know. I was kind of like, eh. It was it was an all right element, I guess. <laughs> like I said, it didn't really didn't really go for me. But um, like I was saying earlier, this scene where there's a couple scenes with some kind of like some mind stuff, and the one where uh, Abra sets up a trap for Rose the Hat it was really cool because she's in there and she gets her hand like stuck in in a cabinet because she was trying to find out stuff about Rose or about Abra, sorry, but then uh, Abra gets into Rose's head and then you see this big cathedral and she's going through it and even Abra has blacked out her uh, her eyes. She doesn't have any eyes and changed her hair color and stuff like that. So, again, I thought there was some cool depiction of that kind of stuff there. Um, but was also odd is that Rose of the Hat and Crow Daddy, they have a whole crew, right? It's, uh, I think it's called, like, the knot uh so the whole crew of them but only like two of them have lines maybe three and do stuff more the rest are just there to just to show that they're chilling out and uh eating the steam from these uh these people uh, but i did like their kind of how they would swarm and then back off like really choreographed really well like almost like they were some sort of uh, yeah, vampire coven kind of a thing, because, like, she would go in to do something, and then they would all just, like, swarm in on it and stuff like that. So, you know, I kind of liked I liked that element of that. But did they all get some... They just all get gunned down by Ewan McGregor and his friend in one scene, which I was expecting, like, some of them to go down, but not just all of them. It just seemed like it was too convenient to just clean out the, <laughs> the rest of the, of the crew, as it were, to get us down to less characters. And same thing when he, when he confronts Crow Daddy, uh, I did like uh, that scene, and it was pretty cool because uh, Crow Daddy has captured Abra, drugged her, and then so Dan Torrance kind of like possesses her, and then he's talking with him, and then basically he's talking about how like, he's like, oh, you know, it kind of makes sense that uh, you'd have such hubris uh, in thinking you're going to live forever because you haven't done up your seatbelt and he crashes the van that they're in. So, and again, I wasn't expecting that to kill him. I was just more expecting, you know, he'd be injured and then something more would happen, but it just kind of like, it's over. <laughs> and then the idea that he's like, okay, we're, the only way we're going to stop Rose the Hat is, you know, lure her to the Overlook and use that kind of as, an, as a battleground. It was, it is fine, you know, it's like, okay, that's I, I, that's what I was saying because that's a difference from The Shining book where there's no more hotel so I don't know where in Doctor Sleep where he goes or what they do kind of a thing so but that final confrontation was again it was all right it, it kind of like he they have a battle in uh, in the maze uh, the, at the hedge maze recreated with the snow and the idea is he's going to try to capture her in one of his like ghost boxes which I didn't think that would work even but maybe i don't know like you know it was just an idea to try i guess it kind of again it wraps up really quickly in that she gets on top of him and she's like starts eating his steam and she's like oh man you were so powerful like how do we miss you blah, blah blah and then he just unleashes all the ghosts on her and she immediately dies or gets absorbed or whatever and then they all glob onto him because he's injured. And, oh yeah, which just before that happens, they recreate the scene from The Shining with Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall where she's got the bat waving it at him. And But in this, it's it's Dan Torrance and uh, Rose the Hat. She's kind of taunting him. He's got an ax, uh, you know, and it's just kind of, it's the same shot. So again, it's like, you know, it's hard to beat such an iconic shot but then it's also like if you don't do it people will be like what are you doing and if you do people are like what are you doing <laughs> uh, but before that final confrontation sorry I wanted to mention so there's a scene when they first get to the overlook Dan Torrance is going around and he's like oh I gotta wake it up and he's, he's walking the halls and stuff like that and like I said they'd recreate it pretty well and then they get he gets to the bar and uh, like I said earlier he's he's gone to AA and, you know, cleaned up his life and stuff like that. And there's a glass there and he goes to the bar 
and we just see some hands and talking about some alcohol and then you know he's talking to somebody and then when eventually it pans up it's uh i don't know the name of his act the actor i didn't get him down here but he's basically like dressed up like jack nicholson and dan torrance is talking to him and i didn't like that entirely because and again this might be this is book versus um movie situation i think because of course in the shining the movie the guy tells jack torrance he's like you're the caretaker you've always been the caretaker but in here he's being depicted as the bartender which i didn't like that i would have liked maybe that there is that other bartender or a guy who looks similar to him because i don't think that guy's still around and then maybe you know Jack sits down beside him and then they have a conversation or something like that, right? Like, because it just, I don't know, I didn't like that, but I liked the the dialogue from the scene. <laughs> like, it was pretty cool because he's ta- telling him about how, you know, he drank because he it was, he could feel the same rage that, uh, that Jack felt and this and that. And anyway, it, like, I liked it. And then he doesn't fall to, t- to the temptation and doesn't have that drink and the glass gets knocked away and stuff like that. So, like I said, I liked the scene. I just kind of would have liked it maybe played a little differently just because I, I liked... I would have liked a different bartender because that's kind of how it went with uh, Jack Torrance in the, the Shining. He's talking to this other bartender before he eventually meets the previous caretaker. So I don't know. Again, maybe just because of the time constraints. By this time, you know, the movie's gone on for like two hours. So <laughs> they just didn't want to run it too long. But... Like I said, it was a good scene. Yeah, basically, like, then it just kind of recreates the same chase where Dan Torrance, he got injured by the axe, by Rose the Hat. So he's limping along with the axe, uh, but they're not outside. They're inside the hotel, and he's chasing Abra and just kind of, like, yelling, and he's semi-possessed because, you know, one side of his face is all messed up and everything. It was a cool image, cool visual, but it was also kind of like, eh, we've... uh, I just watched this. <laughs> but again, I get, you know, he's doing a thing. And eventually, she confronts him. They have some dialogue back and forth. She's all like, you know, blah, blah, blah. He breaks out of his uh, his possession, tells her to leave. And he had set the the hotel boilers to over, over overrun, essentially. And then the hotel burns and catches fire. And there's a little coda at the end of the film. But I don't know. Like I said, like I said earlier, it it was all right. It wasn't the worst thing I've seen. It wasn't definitely not the best thing I've seen. It was definitely not The Shining. So it might be a really better adaptation of the Doctor Sleep book, because I feel like again, like the, they show some time of Dan Torrance when he's working in a hospice, and he uses the, his shine to connect with people, and you know, in their final moments, and help them pass all, pass into the next world and all that kind of stuff like that. So there might be more of that in the book. Um, whereas the movie has to kind of, because it was globe trotting, or not globe trotting a lot, but like bouncing back and forth so much through different storylines in this in the beginning. So it kind of had to breeze through some of that kind of stuff. Where I was kind of actually interested in that. <laughs> I was kind of like, oh, like, what's he doing? How's he, you know, how is this kind of working with his life, right? Um, but we only got a couple scenes of it essentially. So, eh, <laughs> is the final assessment <laughs> gets a strong resounding, eh. I think if you're interested or it's like eventually on some kind of streaming service, check it out. I don't think you should rush out to theaters to see this. There was no kind of, you know, striking visuals. I will say the score was really good. I actually really did like the score a lot. A lot of the times there was like this strong, like beating bass heartbeat especially when they got to the Overlook and it kind of, you know, helped to drive it kind of thing, which I did like that. It just kind of amped it, amped it up to some of the scenes a little bit. So the score was really good. But again, that's not right. You need to be in a theater to see that in order to hear the score. <laughs> and again, I kind of, uh, I really enjoy movie scores. So it's an element I would probably enjoy more than say any say others, but not to say I'm a big movie score snob or anything. <laughs> But you know what I mean. It was, it's not, uh, it's not a, oh my God, I gotta rush out and see this uh, because it's this amazing thing. It was all right. I like some of the performances. The story overall was nothing great. But I mean, if you're gonna just, if you're in for The Shining, 
just watch The Shining. <laughs> Is the assessment. Maybe I'll do a follow-up. Uh, might read the books, I guess, and then I could do a follow-up uh, talk about those books versus these movies uh, to see where those differences lie and just how big of the differences they are. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to say any more. I think I've rambled enough here <laughs> about, about these two movies. But, yeah, that was The Shining and Doctor Sleep. Like I said, if you want to hear a little bit of our thoughts about The Shining, we did it uh, in our horror episode where we had uh, our guests and we talked about some of our top horror movies. If you want to hear some more, Devin and myself, uh, we're, of course, you can find us at tomeofuselessness.com. You can find the podcast on Spotify or iTunes or many other podcast services, which is pretty great. You can contact us on social media. Uh, there's links off their website, or you can check us out on Instagram and Twitter, uh, or you can just email us, tomeofuselessness at gmail.com. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Have a good one.